alone, or four people alone, but that's the missing link here because I said we had one that might be able to come and take them away. Yes, yes, that? yes, yes, and she wanted to stay down away. So we're going to film her. If everyone's okay with that. Yes. Not, not going to be on camera, it's just on me, sorry. <laughs> and I'm really going so if we can avoid me too. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, actually, yeah. So anyway, and so she sort of wants that because she's done so well. Yes, yes. Yeah, she's just okay. overwhelmed now with all I've done. Right. I keep telling Dustin he's that close to work, so <laughs> yeah, that's the best yeah. for Gabba. Yeah. Um, good call. Uh, so I was just talking to Dustin. I was also I was trying to explain, so I should say actually everybody here is a nurse and they all work at the hospital, which hospital is just crazy. Nobody <laughs> wants to educate hospitals now. Um, but um, the other reason, as I said to you guys, that I wanted to have you uh, or have you give your feedback is because of the yeah. withdrawal, yeah. which did we discover that later? Yes. Because it's on the program. Yeah. And did we discover that later? Because it was we about three, no. About three months later, I ended up in hospital, and um, I had a, a an ATOG member up there came to see me and he checked my history and he realised that I was taking too much, or I was getting a script too often, and I was taking too much and it wasn't lasting long enough. That's a different level. Yeah, and he sort of made me feel really uncomfortable, and he said, "Well, you do realise you're going to lose the Suboxone program," and I freaked out because. I know what withdrawal is like and it's disgusting. So that's as soon as I got out of hospital, the first thing I did was ring Jane and let her know that, you know, this is what's going on, this is what's happened. And I need some help getting off the Lyrica because I've been told that I will lose the Suboxone program if I don't stop taking the Lyrica. So that's where we went. Yeah. So we've kind of jumped into the story a little bit ahead, but I'm going to add. The other thing that that person discovered, because they would have worked with the Euros and the hospitals in hospital, mm -hmm. which we sent through the screen when we got to them, it came up as having amphetamine like substance, isn't yeah. it? And didn't he say he'd been using it? Something like that, yeah. So, so his, his urine came up as positive for amphetamine like substances, and we were like, and they, they go, oh, he's a wimp too. So, if you, that's normal, it's not an unreasonable conclusion. But we don't always go, we have clients who say, well, I've never used that. And it's like, maybe you go home, maybe you go home. The first thing I did when I when he told me that, I think that's what freaked me out too, is that they said, you've got men, listen, you've got meth in your urine and we've discovered you've taken all this additional urine. Right? That's putting you at risk of suboxone, which we kind of doubt is like, we're not going to just reduce the whole. We will have to have that conversation and say we need to support you to change these other things as well. But you see, because I've seen so much of this, my first thought is, hmm, I wonder if he's prescribed something else that might come up as positive for stimulants or amphetamine-like substances. Something like Remizodin. Mm. Mm. What's that? Remizodin. Do you want Remizodin for... Yeah, yeah, for... Um... Reflux. Yes, yeah. Okay, so... Oh, yeah. So he was prescribed something for reflux, which will come up as a false positive, as an amphetamine-like substance. So I just want to draw you, I'm sort of, I know I'm sort of jumping into it again, but that's like a thing you kind of got, you got to think wide. You got to, it's, it's sort of like before you jump, like when we're treating people, yes, they're complex stories, but you, before we jump to conclusions, it's like we've got to, we've got to, you know, find the evidence. Is there evidence for that? And could it be something else? And rule out this and that sort of thing. So anyway, could we just go back though, Dustin, to when you first came to us for your own fix? Yes. So what what what's all this going to Well, <clears throat> I was having a lot of uh, tremadol. I was taking a lot of tremadol. I was taking I think ten a day. Um, 
um, in the midst of my addiction. Um, and I was seeing different doctors, like I was doctor shopping, I'd get up every morning and think, well, how am I going to get it today? Well, I've never been here, I'll go there. Anyway, I went to a surgery in, um, I think it was Health Link Medical Centre, which that's where I am now, that's where I'm based, like my medical and everything. I went in Charlene Shemaine, I went in, I got a script off her for Tramadol, and then I went back, I think it was a week later, and asked for another one. And she gave me another one because I told her I liked it. I said I was going away for a couple of months and I needed it. And I think it was about um, three, about two months into being with her, she asked me to sign the medical records over to her from previous doctor surgery. And I didn't want her to find out that I was at another doctor surgery. So I went in to see her one morning and I asked for tramadol. And she said, um, I've checked the history and it looks like you're seeing different doctors. And I said, no, I'm not, not seeing different doctors. I haven't seen you. So she rang the doctor shopping helpline and she was able to write down everywhere I was going, how many slips I had had, where I had them processed. And then she called me up and she said, what's going on? That's what I, I broke down and I said, this is what's going on. And I don't know what to do. So she put me on a, um, a daily dose of Tramadol Meanwhile, she was organising ATOS for me. Can I just yeah. interject that for a second? When you say daily dose, you mean a daily pickup? Yes. That's yes. another thing we would recommend that we do, is that even if it's not like Suboxone or Methadone, it might be Valium. People might be struggling with Valium for their hips and take it more. Doctors will prescribe you a script for Valium their Subox gives you. So we would say, send that script to the chemist. It might be five milligrams TDS. Way we know, at least from this, it's not regulated like um, the opiates as SA, so they could be going somewhere else. But at least this doctor signing the script hasn't led to the overdose. If that gives you, you know what I mean? So sorry, that's what she meant by she tried to. Oh yeah, she wrote on the script. Which she wrote on the script. She gave me the script, and they've got a chemist there in the doctor surgery, and she wrote on the script, "Please dispense daily." Um, so as she, uh, I handed the script over and they were doing that, that's how, um, meanwhile she was organising ATOS for me. Um, and then I had to go and see ATOS and that's when the program started, I went in, yeah. Uh, why, why did you start taking Tramadol in the first place? I had a back injury, or we thought, yeah. we thought it was a back injury. Yeah. Well, I've just recently discovered in the last six weeks, it wasn't the whole time, it was um, kidney stone, where I was getting my back pain. We honestly thought it was back pain. And in the last, what, the 10 years that I was on Tremendol, that's what I thought it was the whole, the whole time. Yeah. And you only ever taken Tremendol and you developed your... No, I, I was on Tremendol for about six years and then they brought Nurofen Plus out. Um, and I got stuck on, I, that, when they used to have the 75 packs, I think they were, and I was taking up to 20 of them a day as well. I went off the, um, the Tremendol for a little while and then they regulated um, Neurofen Plus, and that's when I started on the Tramadol again. Yeah. So you were 20? I was taking day. 20 Neurofen Plus a day, yeah. Sorry, I remember. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 I've um, knocked all the lining off my stomach, yeah. and I have to have daily um, <clears throat> stuff to help me with my stomach as well. So, so I found it difficult at first explaining what was going on because um, when I came in, I was starting to go into withdrawal and I was feeling horrible, I was cranky, I was like, hmm. what can I do, what's going on? I think it was about two weeks before the program started and um, I think the lady that was helping me get on the program was also aware that Charlene was had me on a daily dose of Tremadol and then when I when I went on the Suboxone, or when you go on the Suboxone, you've got to go to the chemist a couple of times that first day to see what dose, or you've got to be in withdrawal, and then you've got to see what dose that you need to take away the withdrawal and give you a, a, a like a daily, I'm okay, I can do this, to give you normal life, basically. Um, yeah, and then she stopped the tramadol as I was doing that. Yeah. So, sorry, could I ask a question? You know how you were taking tramadol and the doctor just started it? Mm. 
and then she came on the battle dose was that much of a reduction? She, I think it went down to five right, so after you, that. You, yeah. you were taking it? Ten. So you were 50 percent of it. Yeah, so you were not experiencing back. some withdrawal. Oh, yeah, yeah. yes, definitely. So, and then you come to us and then there's a bit of an assessment phase. It's usually, it's about a week or sometimes more before we can start day. Like I said, it's got a line-up then we have Monday. So usually they assess the week before and then they get them all ready to go the following week. So there's a bit of time, more time. So you've got well, especially, it all depends on what doctor you see because some doctors um, or some people that I've spoken to in the Chemist Centre on the same program, once they ask for ATODs or they go through ATODs, the doctor stops right then with prescribing anything and then they're in withdrawal for that week to try and get on the program. Yeah. Can I just ask you, yeah. um, when you're preparing for your first day of withdrawal yeah. into the chemist, what did you do for yourself to deal with any anxiety? Or um, well, I suffer from anxiety and depression because of what happened to me in the past and yeah. my anxiety and depression were brought through the roof. Yeah. I couldn't sleep, I couldn't eat. I was walking around the house constantly, the yard I'd do the mowing, trying, it was horrible trying to, yeah, and then um, that's kind of when the pre-gap one started getting oh, out of okay. control because I was taking yeah. that and it would help with the withdrawal. Yeah. And it would give me energy to do stuff. Yeah. So, how long did it take you to get stabilised onto the Suboxone? How long did it take you? I'm on 16, I'll go two, two um, ways. So 16 is a really good, more like good, solid, like not a not a high dose, not a low dose, just a good old therapeutic dose. Actually, what I didn't say actually, do you mind if no, I just add this in? Um, and do you have have you got tabloids? Um, no, I lost my privileges doing that one. I oh, that down and not pretty good one. I did have takeaways, but then I lost it. Okay, so that's okay. So you got really difficult with that. Yeah, yeah, I can apply it in there. Okay. <laughs> Um, the other thing about um, Suboxone that I didn't mention is that um, it's, it's designed in such a way that you can actually double dose and even triple dose, okay? Now, do you mind this? Yeah. There. Um, it's also, sorry, it's also um, during the floods, we had the floods, um, the Stocklands had an emergency shutdown and they... I went in one day to get my dose, and then the next day I went in and it was all closed and there was no word or what was going on. The Suboxone actually lasts for about two, two and a half days on no, one it's dose. Not yeah, so I, I didn't go into withdrawal while I was waiting for the chemist to reopen. Yeah. That's good. So, with, what you can do is you can double dose. So, you're on 16 a day, yeah. are you? So, the only problem with double and triple dosing is in Australia they can't prescribe more than 32 milligrams in a day, okay? That's the ceiling dose. So in theory, um, Dustin could have double dosing at 16 and be on the maximum dose of 32. So that means, what's today, Thursday? Goes in today, gets double dose, they give him 32 and he consumes 32, 32 under the tongue, right? That frees him up, he doesn't have to go tomorrow. Obviously, if you're on a lower dose, if you're on eight, you can triple dose. So you could have 24, you don't have to go. So that's a way, that was another thing when they brought it in as a safety, but it's sort of a more flexible, trying to sort of break that sort of nexus of having to go to the chemist every day and being one of those people that goes to the chemist every day. They're trying to normalise it. It's just a medication and we're trying to keep them up. And the, the um, long-acting will take that to the next level. Okay. So... Um, some, I will just say on that, some clients who are on low doses, four milligrams, triple dosing on four, they find they start to hang out on the third day. It's not as effective. It's more effective on the higher doses. On the higher doses. And but you've never done that. I just double dose twice you know, during a couple of holidays. During the addiction through um, or the coming off the Lyrica, when I lost my takeaway privileges, they would double dose me during the holidays because I wasn't allowed to take anything home. So the, the pharmacist would get the script and it would say, no, take away, it's double dose. So they'll double dose me and it'll last me two days and then I'll go in again if there was another public holiday, they'll double dose me again. And it, it, it lasts, yeah. yeah. Okay, so enter the pre-gap of the Lyrica, right? So you're now on your 16 of the Suboxone, you lost the flu, or you think so? But what's, meanwhile, what's been happening with the... Well, 
Well, the lyric I got out of control, I think about three months after um, I started on the Spock Zone, like, it actually happened before I got on the Spock Zone. Um, I was taking more because I was in the withdrawal. But um, going over the, the period that I was addicted, I started taking, there was 10 a day, oh, sorry, five a day, and then that didn't do anything, so I went up to 10 a day, and I think I ended up taking that. Day, something like that, um, to just get the, or just to get rid of the withdrawals. That in the end, it wasn't giving me any high or any, um, what do you say, uh, a good feeling. It was just taking away the withdrawal of it. And when I ran out, the withdrawals from the Lyrica was worse from the Tremadol. It feels like I was going to die. And and the, the thing about the um, the Lyrica, I think because it didn't get picked up, when I, when they urine test you, they look for certain things like the Suboxone will show up, opiates will show up, but they have to send away and specifically ask for Lyrica. That's what they do at the moment when they urine test me. They have to specifically ask for the Lyrica to see if there's any in my system because it won't show up on a normal test. So the way that works, just so you know, um, a routine urine flow screen in the little yellow bottle. Um, we send off to pathology, it's tested here in council, and we'll come back and it'll say there's opiates, there's cannabis, there's amphetamines, you know, whatever, that is the, the basics, right? If, if, say, there's opiates and the person will say, I have not used opiates, there's no way, I absolutely haven't. What we can do is send it for what we call an extended. So we actually have to call Brisbane, it gets flown to Brisbane. The specimen's kept, all those specimens are kept for seven days, so you can get a review that's resolved pretty quick within 24 hours. Um, if we want an extended, we just ring Brisbane and they'll test it and it'll tell you everything that's in it from, you know, to Mazepan to Lexapro to, you know, whatever. You know, yeah, anything that doesn't thing. show up on the yeah. test. Yeah. And I will say on that, there's a whole lot of science around that, I won't not get at it, but sometimes um, if you, for example, have. Um, more. If you have if you have codeine, codeine metabolizes as it breaks down into morphine. Okay, so the person will say, you know, I had a panadine, it'll come up as opiates, or oh, that'll be the panadine I had the other day when I had that toothache. And they go, Oh, well, you're not sure. So we send it off and it'll come back and they go, Oh, morphine there. But actually the morphine is metabolite of the codeine. So you just have to be careful. Like it's you have to have an index of suspicion. We, it's a trust thing. Yeah. It's a trust thing, yeah, yeah. But we've got to be open with, like I said, the, the, met, the amphetamine and the remitter that came up. And, you know, you can find yourself clubbing a picture of somebody that's just not true. Anyway, so you, uh, what, what happened with the, oh, it was it all was triggered by your presentation at hospital because you had two down pneumonia or something? Yeah, so I got um, pneumonia and what's that other one? Uh, very contagious. Oh, um, you had influenza. Yeah, influenza as well. A influenza A, I think it was. Oh, they had me in a separate room anyway, and they had to wear um, gloves and masks and everything like that. Yeah, and that's when they found out about the addiction because I didn't particularly like the way that he handled it when he when he found out. But what happened was before I went into hospital, I realised I had a problem. Um, and I had actually run out of Lyrica completely. I still had two repeats on my repeat, and I was going around to each pharmacy, and they said, no, you only had it three days ago. No, we can't do it. We can't dispense it. Um, you say, well, I'm going away. Too bad. You can't have it. And I went, I think I went to six different chemists before I went to the one where I was getting my dosing done for the Spock zone. And I actually broke down in front of the pharmacy and said, look, I've got to go to ATOS on Monday. I don't know what to do. I'm stuck on Lyrica. I've got the withdrawals, it feels like I'm going to die, and he actually dispensed the script for me, but he was he did the same thing the doctor did. He would only give me a certain amount to go away with. He wouldn't give me the whole script, and then he kept the script. And then when I ran out, he would dispense it again for me until I went into ATODS to let them know what was going on. And that's the ATODS guy that works the hospital. He actually checked the system and asked, well, why is this being dispensed to or three days in a row, and that's when I explained to him, this is what happened. 
I didn't want to get the pharmacist into trouble, but he actually helped me until he said, you've got to go to ACOG. If I find out you haven't got to ACOG, I will report it to ACOG. So that was the deal. He would dispense it for me and then I'd go to ACOG and let them know. And that's when I think I rang you, said, I've got a problem, I need help. And I suppose if I could relate that from the county that I, I don't think he's got that call. Yeah, he is, yeah. yeah. Um, I remember what struck me about that conversation was he was the person who clearly recognised the problem, but had absolutely, this was like, it was more like he was run down a, run down a tunnel and it was a blind end. <laughs> he couldn't see a way out. He didn't know there was a solution. And, 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 a lot, and, and understandably, I'm interested to know what you were feeling emotionally in terms very, of... Very, very emotional. I was, I was lost. And I honestly thought when I was addicted to that, I thought the Suboxone would help. No, oh, it's all right, I've got the Suboxone. The Suboxone did nothing. It works on different receptors. And the Suboxone did. And I was sitting in my chair and it felt like I was sinking back in the chair. I was having, I was hallucinating. I thought I was speaking to Alan and I was actually speaking to the wall. He thought the drip machine was a telephone at one stage. Yeah, the drip machine. Oh, babe, can you turn the telephone off? Yeah. It's the drip machine, babe. I was hallucinating, I was, um, I cooked dinner and I didn't realise I cooked dinner. Um, I, yeah, it was just, it was horrible, it was disgusting. If I had my go over again, I'd rather come off Tremadol by itself without Suboxone than go off Lyrica again. It's disgusting, the withdrawals from Lyrica. And, um, and that's when I spent the day up here after we organised everything and um, they dosed me up with the Lyrica until the withdrawals went away. And that's why I think it started at six. Um, there was four, four in the morning and four at night, and then three days later it'd go down. Yeah, three in the morning, four at night, and then two in the morning, three at night, and then it just went down. And I haven't had any withdrawal. I've been off it for two and a half, three months now, and I haven't had any withdrawals whatsoever because they gradually took me off it. Yeah, but if, yeah. So the principle they use there is for you do that with benzos, like ideally with a benzo withdrawal, if you can have them as an inpatient admission, we'd love to see this where you actually, you, you, so you're in a controlled environment, you know they can't access any of the medication, you park them and then you watch. And when the withdrawals start to come in, you titrate, instead of reducing down, you titrate up. So you take as the withdrawals, you start experiencing the withdrawal, you give, they gave Lyrica until the withdrawal settled, yeah. and that's the point at which is your threshold point. So that would obviously be four and four or something. Yeah. And then you park it on that for a bit, and then you take one out and so on, do it that way. So you titrate up in that case to work out your threshold. Because of that, I mean, I'm not an expert on this, but probably of all of those, I think I said a few that day, there was 10 years, 18, 10 years or 18 years ago, you probably pissed me out. A lot of it probably wasn't actually, you know, was there. But there's something else, as I said earlier, around dependence. There's the physical bit, but there's the psychological bit. And um, that's the hardest to overcome is psychological. Because when I was on the tramadol, I would get up every single morning because it, it had 10 in the morning, and then next day 10, and then the next day I'd have to find more tramadol. And it gets to a routine because I was on it for so long. I'd get up in the morning and I'd think, where am I going to get it from today? How am I going to do it? How am I going to afford it? And then when I was on the Suboxone program or after, I think about a week later, for about three weeks I'd get up in the morning, oh, that's right, I don't have to do that anymore. I'm, I'm right. And it's just, Did it worked. Oh, we've, we've put away about $300 yeah. since then. Yeah. 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 It was costing me like, I was going to Everything, burgers. put it that way. Yeah, I was going to cash and burgers, I was hopping stuff, I was fucking my wedding ring, I was, and it's just, it works in a cycle and it was horrible. I think I threatened him at one stage, you do something or I'm walking. Mm. So, if you don't mind my asking, <laughs> did Ellen know? She didn't know. I knew something, something was up. She knew something was up, and she didn't know, I think, for about five years. She knew I was taking tramadol, but she didn't know how much. And then she caught me in the kitchen one day with 10 in my hand. She goes, what are you going to do with that? I was, I'm just putting it in the box and I've walked off to take it. And she cornered me one day and said, what's going on? And that's when I admitted to her what was going on. And she knew, you know, 
every day I went out, she thought I was going to see friends or going to see her mum, where I was actually running around all day to doctors. And yeah. So, can you just tell us a little bit about the pain in that time? How did it feel? Like, did you come oh, out? with myself. I knew, I knew after about five years it was a problem and I was horrified with myself. I didn't know what to do. I didn't even know how to contact ATOC. I knew ATOC was there but I didn't know what to do. Um, I was lagging. I was, I was losing a lot of weight. I was sick all the time. Especially when you go to a doctor and they say, well, what are you on that for? And then they question you and you have to make up and some doctors catch on to what's going on. They said, no, sorry, I can't, I can't give you that script. Can you go and get some Panadol or something? And you go to the next doctor. And when you're going into withdrawal, you think, well, what am I going to do? And then you try everything to try and get it. You know, I, one thing I never did, or two things I never did, was inject and illegally buy it off the street. So I always had a script for it. No matter what, I, I wouldn't go down that road. Well, I've got a life. I've got a life. I'm, I'm happy. We're happy. Yeah. Um, our marriage is back on track. We've got a physical relationship, which when I was on all the drugs, I couldn't sleep with my wife because, you know, I was always constantly thinking, what do I do? What do I do? And we've got our physical relationship back emotional. And it just feels awesome. Like, the ATOS is, you know, hands down, they're the best. Like, they'll get you up and going again. Yeah. So, and so, how would you be spending your days now? Like, are they different? Are they different? Very different. I've got myself a YouTube channel. I help people on YouTube. Yeah, I help people on YouTube. I've explained my story with Miracle Toss. I've got a video on that. Oh, really? I think that's up to 500 views now. And I get people kind of, there was some guy that contacted me from the UK because they're not regulated over there yet. And he said, well, I'm taking 40 a day. What do I do? And, you know, I said, well, if you've got an ATOX there, go and see them. Go and talk to your doctor. If you've got a problem and you're worried, talk to your doctor. Like I spoke to my doctor and she said, when, when it happened, she stood back and I was in the room for about four hours. She canceled two appointments to help me at that time. Doctors have to listen, they have to help you, they, they, they can't judge you. Like she said, I can't judge. She said, this is what's going on. She goes, look, it's not your fault. You know, well, it kind of is your fault, but don't go down that track where doctors are going to be tough on you. They're, they're only there to help you. Like, if they say no, they're not saying no because they want the arseholes. They're saying no because they don't want you to go away and overdose. And then they've got that script there. Well, why did this doctor prescribe this, knowing this? You know what I mean? And they don't do it to be... Like, I used to always think when I went into a doctor's surgery, and they said, no, I'll be being arseholes about it. You know, I need this. Why can't you give it to me? Exactly. Yeah. So, that's Did you get your YouTube channel? Uh, it's Dusty2112. Okay. Um, so, what was I going to say? Oh, just on that point about Dusty's GP, um, oh, I think you're going to make some good. Oh, she's awesome. But I've been with her for nearly a year now and she's just. She is very good. So, me out yeah. Me. But the, the, a relationship from the program point of view with the GP is really important. So, there's so many things I could talk about, but we have regular, we've got a procedure about having regular communication with the GP. So, so because it's really important that GPs know what we're prescribing. And if they start it on medication, we need to know. I mean, that's sort of business as usual, but um, that's sometimes difficult for clients. They don't want us to know who their GP is because we might, you know, we will say, look, we will urge GPs not to prescribe benzos or not to do this or not to do that. We can't tell them. You know, we can't control what they do, but we have an obligation to communicate with other health providers around their medicines we're prescribing that might impact if we're prescribing. Well, my doctor got a letter off ATOC and she showed me where they said, look, please don't prescribe this. And then she won't. If she gets a letter from ATOC saying this, this, and this, she won't do it. No matter what I say, she won't prescribe it. Plain and simple. Just yeah. it's really a hard work finding a doctor that really understands yep. you. Definitely. I think I've had six doctors in the last five years. Is there any way we can make that process easier for people? 
Or is it just kind of hit and miss? You've got to you go from doctor to doctor. I reckon there there could be a program there where if you've got a problem, you can get onto the program where there's doctors there that will like um like my doctor. She's got a couple of people like me through ATOS, and you know she, I mean she should be up there as a person of contact. Um, I reckon there should be a program there where if, if you've got a problem, you can get that program, you can get a doctor that will understand. Listen, I mean, some I've told the last doctor that I was with that I've got a problem with tramadol. And every time I went into that surgery, I would sit down. He would have a script for tramadol there ready. Printed, signed, just give it to me. No matter what I said, you know, I've, I've got a problem with tramadol, I need tramadol. That's what he would do, and that's why I left him in the end, because he was just making my problem worse. You know, I could go there one day, and then two days later, I could go there again, and he would give me the script again. You know, where they're not allowed to do that. I don't know how he got away with it. Yeah. Um, yeah, and also the hospital as well. Every time I'm in the hospital, <laughs> I say to the nurse, or ED's all right, to say to ED what what you're on, rah, rah, rah. and then you go up into the ward and the nurses come around and do what they have to do, give you medication. So I'm also on a Suboxone program and I need to, and they look at you with a blank, what's Suboxone like? Last time I was in hospital, um, I think it took them five hours to figure out what Suboxone was. Um, as soon as the pharmacist came and see me, plain and simple, she knew what it was straight away. And, yeah, and every morning I got up, oh, different nurses, I need Suboxone. The same thing would happen. And I think there should be a program at the hospital educating nurses on what it is. The problem, like, you know, suboxone is not available there, you know. So, uh, you know, you have to get the pharmacy to get there. Mm -hmm. like it's it's so in the pharmacy downstairs, but it's not that one. Yeah. The patient yeah. is actually waiting for it at 8 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> the pharmacy opens at 8 o'clock because maybe they have ended up at midnight and we didn't have that one. And, you know, the, you know, there should be some program that, you know, it comes like this, you know, mm -hmm. like it takes time and, you know, yeah. we, we are like... And going so, away yeah. too, because yeah. there's been a couple of times where we've had to go away and had to cancel because we couldn't, didn't know how to get the the drug where we were going. Yeah, well, that's up to ATOS as well. Like, if um, I said to my worker uh, a few months ago, we we're thinking about going on a boat cruise, what do I do with box Do I get it? They said no, they will organise with the pharmacy on the boat to dose you daily while you're on the boat. Yeah. No? Yeah, I think you do. Because <laughs> that's what she said. Yeah. I guess the other thing, um, it is, as I said earlier, it is quite limited for um, that sort of stuff. If somebody wanted to go, say, to Cairns for the weekend, um, the quickest way, like you'd think, oh, well, I have to apply for take. I mentioned earlier about the takeaway. I won't go into the detail of the process, but they have to put in an application that's formally for them. We have to fill it in as a caseworker. We have to get a urine and it goes to a meeting with the clinical team, with the consultant, and it's discussed and the risks are assessed and so on. The urine has got to be clean and all of that sort of stuff. And that meeting happens once a week on Wednesday. At the moment, we don't have a doctor, a consultant for a couple of weeks, so we can't have a meeting. So there's no written approvals. So that's a bit of a problem. Um, but Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
but so we thought that about that too. Um, but it can be problematic, yeah, it can. And certain countries, um, we've got one of our clients is falling in love online with somebody in China, or you know, one of those states, Tajikistan or somewhere, and um, we managed to get in through over the sea a few times. <laughs> so yeah, all sorts of things can happen, but we do have a lot of those. It's a bit, bit weird. But I don't know about that for us. We will talk about that. Um, okay, so what else was I going to ask you? Um, just in terms of, oh, the other thing I was going to say in terms of the interface with the hospital, just so you guys know, so box, so these treatment drugs um, are not, if any doctor can't prescribe them, they're not available for, by, for prescribing by any doctor. It's not a very difficult thing to do. Um, there is a little course they do that's literally two hours, I think. It's just a bit of an online thing. And then there's, they've got to sit with a um, authorised prescriber to see a couple of patients. The issue is more, like, we would like to get more GPs doing it. If you were in Brisbane, a lot of GPs would do it. So there's ATOD services, but there's also GPs have their own programs. Towns is a smaller place, and we, at the moment, there's one GP, and she's got, I think, five or six clients, and she, that's enough for her because she just, you know, it's a certain sort of work, and she has all the other coughs and colds and things, and so she just wants a combined program. Um, but, um, yeah, so when you go to the hospital, that's the problem, and that's why I love to get clients in for this session for you guys, and that's why I'm so pleased that I have people yeah, here all the places yeah. in different parts of the hospital. I, I would like something at the hospital, like a, a, a talk or a program or something from that nurse to know what it is, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? So, because um, there would be a lot of people that would say it to the nurse, and then, you know, I've said it. When I was in hospital last time, I think I reminded the nurse four or five times because she kept forgetting. She did the medications and then she would go away to do something she'd forget about it. And that's that's what worries me. You know, if other people out there that say it, they wouldn't say it anymore and then they go and withdraw and they wonder what's going on. And that's what worries me. That's why I'd like a program or something at the hospital to help the staff. So in a, in a group, so just so you guys know, you, you may well know this, there is, so we're a community program. We're involved in Um, when you go into hospital though, there's actually a procedure and the client becomes an inpatient and there's an internal hospital procedure, which is actually really hard to start in most of it, um, which is about what happens and who does what and all that sort of stuff and whose responsibility it is. So sometimes, because we're in the community, we don't, like we didn't know you were in hospital last week or whatever it was. Like, you're probably too quick to think, oh, I better ring ATOD. You just have to go into hospital. And then the hospital don't think always, oh, they're an ATOD's client, we better ring them and make sure they know. You know what I mean? So we actually found out Dustin was recently in hospital um, because he rang us from the ward. Or no, no, I was trying to ring you. I yeah, you were trying to ring me, and then I, um, then I rang you back and let you know I was in hospital. Yeah, that's how we found out. So, so really before the hospital takes over providing the those for Dustin when he's an inpatient, that part of what the procedure will say is that they need to ring his dosing pharmacy and find out when was his mm. last dose. Yeah. So if he went into hospital at 11 o'clock this morning, um, you know, did he get his dose on the way to the hospital? The hospital tonight want to make sure that they don't give him his dose for today if he's already had it. Yeah. Also, another thing that gets fairly frustrating is when you get out of hospital, hospital's got to contact pharmacy and let them know when they were last dosed. Now, last time I got out of hospital, I had to wait seven hours, I think it was. I went into my chemist to get my dose, and she refused to dose me and said, no, you've just gotten out of hospital. They haven't contacted us yet to let us know. Um, and then she rang, I think she rang the ward to find out what was going on. They got on the computer and said, no, it hasn't been dosed yet. And they said, no, we can't say that. We have to talk to the pharmacist. The pharmacist has to let us know, but the pharmacist was in a meeting for three hours. So even though she got told me I didn't have my dose mm. that day, mm. the pharmacist has to tell that pharmacist what's going on. It can't be an ordinary nurse. Mm -hmm. Is that something yeah. then that the doctors could maybe put in their discharge letter to you? Yeah, yeah that's the idea. Yeah, that's yeah. part of then the discharge we can get yeah. Yeah. Of the That's right. right. However, we do find that we've got to get the key like, of yeah. the discharge mm -hmm. letter. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. We don't demand to have a copy before yeah. you leave. That way you make sure. And also, done. if we know they're there, well, we can be working as well. 
Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 Ye
but it does happen fairly, it's like fairly often <coughs> that we come in with a free quote, yeah. 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 especially yeah. like because when it comes to our form being there for very long, like there's one particular award that's been there for a little bit longer, mm-hmm. but it still depends on what's more online. Yeah, and that's the whole thing. Yeah, it's doing it. What time the pharmacist stop off? Oh, it depends on the day, sometimes the weekend, at night, seven, six, 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 six. But then even we have to contact the pharmacy, we have to go through the after hours, we cannot contact the ED uh, pharmacist uh, by ourselves. Mm-hmm. So we have to go through the uh, nurse manager, then if they are there, then that one, otherwise somebody has to come from the yeah. home mm-hmm. to bring this whole thing. So that yeah, takes, you know, mm-hmm. by the time the mm-hmm. patient is actually on the top, like, <laughs> There's another medication out there that's very similar to Suboxone and it's a tablet. They got it wrong last time I was in there and they tried to dose me with the tablet and I said, that's not it. And they said, well, it had a different name. Like, this, what's the name of the Suboxone? Yeah, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a, yeah. something like that. And they got the tablet wrong. They were going to give me the tablet instead of the, the wafer on the tongue. And I said, that's not right. They're, they're, not, they're not tablets. It's a, it's a wafer yeah, on the tongue. Yeah, some of these is only ever in white form. Is no, it? Suboxone is only yeah. ever in white right. form. Some of these is the tablet. Mm. So yeah. Some of these come out before Suboxone and it's good. They take it under the tongue. Yeah. And you can imagine one of the reasons they brought the wafer out was, uh, and they're about to put Suboxone into it, but with the tablet, um, you know, the buyer had to have a couple of tablets. So you imagine it's like a hard tablet. Mm. So, so what they did, Hard tablets sitting under the tongue is going to take a long time to dissolve, but it's also very easy to remove and mm. convert. So what the way it was dispensed, the way we recommend it, there are a few people involved, um, because it, I was told it's, oh, I'm not come back to that. Um, what they do is they recommend put the tablet in a pestle and just go bang with the pestle and water to not make it like clumps, but just roughly break it up. Mm. Well, it's the same thing with the wafer. You, you're not allowed to leave a chemist. You will whip it in front of the pharmacist. You have to show them that you're putting it. You have to whip the tongue out. You have to show them that you're putting it in your mouth. You're not allowed to leave the pharmacy, or the pharmacy until it's dissolved. Like you've got to lift the tongue up and let them show them that it's gone. But I find with the wafers, even if you touch them, they start dissolving. Yeah, they do. Yeah. You see, they, when they hit the fork of the closer, they, they sort of become gluey almost. Mm-hmm. Um, so, but sometimes, <laughs> but you should really have a drink of water and bleed them out. First. Yeah, that's what they, they, they normally get you to do that, but some pharmacists will just walk out and give it yeah. to you and you've got to ask for the water. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So how long does this suboxone last? Does it depend on, you say, how so much you have? No, well, they're all long acting, so yeah. they're, they're really 24 hours. So I was saying to Dustin last week, actually, when you're angry, I was thinking about my brother, it was in hospital. He normally goes to the chemist early in the morning. Mm-hmm. So we would recommend that to get the most effectiveness out of this dose, we should try and make this dose at around the same time every day. So you have a nice 24 hour sort of run of it, rather than, you know, go early one day and really late the next, and you've got more than 24 hours, and you're not, you might start to just break through the withdrawal. So it's nice to get into a pattern. And also, the pharmacists at the hospital on the system when they come around with the computer. They were right up on the system. He's not allowed to have it for twelve thirty or seven thirty or six thirty. And like I told the pharmacist last time, I said it doesn't work like that. I need my dose eight thirty. I get my dose every morning at eight thirty. But that every time I'm at the hospital, I don't get it till after midday. So you no matter that. what we're doing, if we've got something on important on that day, like family yeah, stuff that's, or that's whatever, he goes straight down to the chemist and. Waits for the cabinets to open. Mm. Gets out of it. <laughs> so, if it's your day 30, you come into ED, say at 10 o'clock, would you expect morphine to have an analgesic effect at 10 o'clock? Well, would it be for me? I mean, I had the suboxone at 8 30 yeah. that morning. Oh, oh, look, so, you were over 24 hours? And no, not at all. Yeah, it's, it's, it's quite long acting. Mm. It works the other way. Like, sometimes clients. Just not going to they ring up and they can't get to the chemist for whatever reason they're not on the day. And actually, you know, and we want to see people not miss doses, we want to see them go through that. And occasionally, one day, okay, that's okay, you know, go without a dose of something if you don't like the dose. No, that well that that's
that surprised me how well it held up. Yeah. That's what I thought when you said that. So you can reassure people it is quite because what you've got to what you've got to understand too, if you are taking the antibiotics, you're gonna build up like a little bit more goes over each day. Do you know what I mean? Like it's not like it runs, it goes it goes a bit longer than twenty four hours. It's not gonna have the same effect as at the end of the twenty four hours that does it all wrong or out after the dose. But there will be some residual left. And then you have the next one. So you've got the next lot plus the bit of residual, and then you have the next, you know, you can see that cumulative effect. Mm -hmm. So sometimes I actually say to clients, you know what, experience a day without a dose. Realise that you can survive. You can talk yourself through this. You're going to be fine. And that builds confidence that, you know what, I can move away from this. That in itself is a really, really good thing. Well, it was, it was scary, scary, on scary on that day. It was scary on that day because I went to pick, have my dose, found a big sign on the door, emergency. Yeah. Stockland will be closed for blah blah blah. I think it was the yeah. No, I, I actually freaked out. Not like, shit. What do I do now? And I actually um, the next day, Atos contacted me and asked me if I had my dose, and they sent me to another chemist to get the dose. And he actually, I think he gave me four days worth of doses. Yeah. 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 I think there was about four pharmacies open in town. Mm. And I was one of those two people. <laughs> so we had to ring Brisbane, we had to get the phone, we had emergency, there are emergency things at, at pharmacies in, in, in actually in natural, we've got a procedure around this in the um, natural disaster events and that. Um, you can get approval for um, up to seven, I think, but um, we got approval for only five takeaways. So you wind it throughout the time. Yeah. It's 50 minutes, but about 20 minutes for lunch. Oh my <laughs> okay, so all good? Yeah, happy with that. So is my health record health? My health Actually, that's something I wanted to say. Um, I, during the midst of my um, addiction, I went and seen another uh, another doctor. He was an African doctor. He was on, he was in Kerwin, you know, on the way to um, Health Link. Down Gow Drive. No, no, yeah, on Down Gow Drive. They're on the way to Health Link. And he's right on the corner there. It's where a knife house used to be. Anyway, I went in there and I asked for Lyrica and I asked for um, I asked for Tremadol. Um, and then to divert his attention, I also asked for an Asper spray and um, there was something else. I told him something else was wrong anyway. And he said, do you mind if I check your My Health record? And I said, yeah, that's fine. I didn't think you'd find anything. And then he got on the computer, and this is why I reckon more doctors should have this tool with them, or they do, but they never use it. And he got onto my health records, and he could see that two days ago I had a five repeat Lyrica script, I had a Tremadol script, and I had an asthma script. He said, Sorry, I can't help you. And that's, that's what frustrates me because a lot of people go to doctors, and the doctors just dispense it all out. They've got that tool there that they can use. If they suspect something's going on, they can get onto that website and they can see when, or they've got the phone there to, to, to ring the Dr. Shopping Helpline to tell them. And it tells you exactly where you've been, what date, how many doses you've had. They've got that tool that they never use. And it surprises me because that's the first doctor that I ever came across in the whole 10 years that used that tool. And I mean, I even mentioned it to Charlene, you know, and she uses it all the time, she said. You know, if she suspects something's wrong, she'll get on that website. <laughs> and it surprises me that more doctors don't use it. Sorry. Okay, so the brain is really a good thing.